This is Professor Simon's history classroom. And Professor Simon is out again on the Greeks. So this week, Alexander the Great has returned to talk about this week's lectures, which will be on me, Alexander the Great, the greatest conqueror in history. So this week he will talk about the rise of Macedonia, how Macedonia, this little pretty small state, eventually went on to conquer the world, conquer Greece, it conquered all of the Persian Empire, including Egypt, it went and took over Mesopotamia, all the way to Iran and India. So he will go into that and then talk about the Hellenistic Age, how that came next afterwards, when all of that culture began to synthesize throughout that region. So that is the main lecture for this week. Also, he will include a review for the second exam, which the second exam for this semester will be on ancient China and, of course, the lectures on Greece, which I have been narrating for Professor Simon since he's been out. So where has he been? Well, he's been on a trip to Europe. So he'll, he'll be back later. So anyway, by the way, I had a dream last night. And you know what the dream was? I was president of, of the United States. The United States of Alexander. I, I can't believe it. And anyway, as president, I did several things to try and make it a great state. The first thing I did was I issued decrees. You know, that's what us rulers do. We issue decrees and you have to follow my laws or you will die. <laughs> so anyway, the first decree I made was I moved the capital. I didn't like Washington, D.C. So I moved it to Alexandria, Louisiana. Why would I do that? Why would I move it to that place? Well, it's close to Mardi Gras. They have Mardi Gras every year down there. And then I could get my king cake. So that was my first decree. My second decree I issued was I would get rid of all the injury attorneys, all those billboards uh, that we have in Louisiana, United States. And I would basically destroy all that. Uh, I would kill all the you know, injury attorneys, sink them to bottom of sea. So that's my second one. And then my third decree, my third decree would be no more wars. You ask, why would Alexander, the greatest conqueror in history, want to have no more wars? Well, if you're going to fight a war, you need to conquer. Remember that, that third decree. Finally, what would I do if I would have lived to be in my 50s, you know, I died at the age of 32. What would I conquer next? Would I conquer the Ukraine? Would I conquer Russia? That would be a nightmare. Forget it. <laughs> so anyway, this week, I will be talking about me, Alexander the Great, the greatest conqueror in history. And don't forget, about looking at the review for the week, of course. By the way, the Alexander Lecture will be, of course, part of a second exam bonus quiz. I'll be, he'll be giving out Professor Simon, so make sure you watch that lecture. Don't forget, he has discussions, lots of discussions, of course, in Canvas. Uh, if you want bonus points for the semester, don't forget about that, too, uh, as well. So. Anyway, that's it for this preview, of course, for this week on the Greeks, the history of the Greeks. Thank God my father, Zeus, was the greatest person in the world. He made me what I am. Today, I'll kind of talk about that. I'll kind of get into the history of Alexander the Great. Uh, of course, if you know about Macedonia, uh, it was this kingdom that started uh, way back during the Greek Dark Ages. Uh, they think it rose out of a city-state. 
Uh, and then, of course, by the fourth century, uh, Alexander the Great and his father, Philip, Philip II, and we'll talk about him today, of course, that particular state will eventually rise up, take over most of Greece. Uh, and then we'll get to the main thing, of course, today, which is they'll conquer the Persian Empire. So um, let me get, of course, a little background into Alexander the Great, uh, of course, and the Macedonians from uh, ancient times. Uh, if you think about uh, Macedonia, it was a state that kind of rose out of the Greek Dark Ages. Uh, they think that this particular uh, city-state uh, went back probably, I want to say, 8th, 9th century BC at the latest when it kind of started to develop in northern Greece. Then over time, it became a kingdom. Uh, and um, kind of talk about the name Macedonia or uh, also known as Macedon. Uh, as well. Uh, Macedonia, uh, you see here in this map right here, kind of kind of show that real quick for you. But um, you can see Macedonia or Macedon, you know, see develop way up in the northern part of Greece uh, today. It's also, they think, part of now what is uh, the Republic of, I think it's called North Mace Macedon or Macedonia. And um, they believe that Macedonia, at least the name anyway, is derived from this ancient ancestor named Mac Macedon or uh, Macednos, I think is also the other name it's often called. And um, so that's where the origin of the word came from. And they think that this, this uh, ancient ancestor is kind of like almost like equivalent to like, uh, remember Helen, famous Greek ancestor and king. They believe it's like some kind of early king of that region. Uh, and so that's where the name basically came from originally. Uh, they do think that the name Macedonia does kind of translate as meaning either tall one or highlander. Uh, and uh, they think that this was because of the fact that the Macedonian peoples uh, developed mostly in mountainous regions of northern Greece, especially where the Pindus Mountains are uh, there today. Uh, and uh, they think that um, originally it was pronounced Macedon or Macedonia, but uh, over time, uh, the name became kind of slurred. And so I think in Europe, Western Europe especially, uh, they started to pronounce it Macedon or um, Macedonia. Uh, and so that's the name, of course, that they pronounce it uh, today. Uh, but, um, yeah, of course, by the 4th century, you start to see the rise of Macedonia. They'll eventually take over all of Greece, most of it, uh, and then organize it into kind of a Hellenic or Greek league, I'll get to later, later called the League of Corinth. Uh, and this mostly happened under the King Philip II. We'll, we'll talk about him first, the most, and then we'll, we'll get into uh, Alexander the Great, his son, uh, that follows. And of course, Alexander's going to take this state. He's going to conquer most of you know, the Persian Empire. Um, kind of, um, I think I've got this also right here, kind of a slide here. But yeah, those are some of the things, of course, right there. You can see kind of a statue of Philip II uh, on, on the right. Uh, Philip, by the way, and Alexander were part of a dynasty uh, that they call the Argia dynasty. Uh, and that's often the Greek name that they call it. And um, they had other kings before Philip II, but they weren't as well known uh, until really about the mid to late 4th century BC. Uh, and um, Philip, you see right here, uh, famous, by the way, for losing an eye, which I think, I don't know if that was in battle, but I think I think he got some kind of illness in his eye and basically lost it. But Philip was the king of Macedonia, you can see from um, 359 to 336 BC. Uh, and it's under him that Macedonia really starts to become a major power in the region. Uh, they think he's kind of the one that kind of develops a lot of their military and a lot of their strategies that Alexander the Great uh, would use uh, later. Uh, and um, one thing about Philip uh, here, uh, here's kind of, kind of showing also some other um, maps here. Of the re oh, by the way, uh, kind of look at that map. Uh, you can see that's about where Macedonia was, like a long time ago in ancient times. You look at the right there at the top, uh, you can see that's the region of it. And now I think now, I think Macedonia is made up of 
northern Greece, and then that Republic of Macedonia, which I think they changed the name to North Macedon or something like that. Uh, but that's the geographic area of, of where uh, Macedonia was. Uh, that symbol, down, by the way, on the bottom right, that was their main symbol uh, that they used. Uh, and I think I've got a, a image right here of it, the Virginia symbol. Uh, it was a symbol of the sun. Uh, and uh, it was kind of had a lot of symbolism to it, but it was a 16 uh, point star, uh, which supposedly represented a combination of the 12 Olympians we talked about before, and then also the four elements uh, that I talked about also uh, as well. And I think Virginia was also the name of one of their cities, uh, capitals that they ruled from. Uh, they also had uh, other cities like Pella, uh, which probably became more important by the time of. Philip and Alexander the Great. I think that one's kind of was actually one of their main capitals later. And then they also had also Thessalonica uh, as well, was another city uh, as well as, that was famous. And that was the one that's now the, the majority city in the northern part of Greece. I think around a million people live there today, the modern city of Thessalonica. But yeah, one thing about Philip, he was known for developing a lot of their military tactics, uh, which one thing uh, that was kind of famous uh, was the Macedonian phalanx uh, had this thing they, they where they used what they call the short and shield tactic on the battlefield, uh, and that was where the cavalry would be used as an offensive weapon, usually on the flanks of the, of the, of the Macedonian army uh, to kind of probe weaknesses in the uh, enemy. Uh, and then they had the infantry, which was kind of in the center using hoplites. Uh, they would use that as a defensive shield, de yeah, defensive shield, basically. So, yeah, the cavalry was the sword, infantry was the shield. Uh, and uh, they used heavy, heavy uh, phalanx formations. The Macedonian phalanx, if you know about it, the centerpiece was the use of a 16 by 16 phalanx formation, about 256 phalangites. They use these pikes, these long, long spears I told you about, called a sarissa, uh, which are, I think, on average about 18 to 20 feet tall at the most. They weigh 25 pounds. Actually, I'm sorry, 15 pounds, excuse me, 15 pounds, uh, pretty heavy. Uh, and um, they had to be carried by, by two, two hands, of course, uh, in battle. And so, like, usually the first, uh, I think, four rows or so would lower their, their spears in battle. When they would, and that of course the the this phalanx was used to repel not just infantry but cavalry or whatever that might charge them uh, on the battlefield. Uh, here's kind of an image showing like the Macedonian battle formation with the infantry in the middle, and you got your cavalry on the wings. I think a lot of this was probably influenced by the Persians. Uh, Persians kind of would use these kind of tactics, and so I guess because of Xerxes coming in, you know, invading from the north in Greece, that probably had a big impact on their, you know, types of military tactics they used uh, later. Uh, they also had what they call the companion cavalry. Uh, this was an elite heavy cavalry of the Macedonians uh, that by Philip's time they had kind of developed. Uh, and it was, like I said, the main offensive weapon uh, that was used to break enemies' flanks. Uh, they would usually try to probe weaknesses in it. And uh, it was about two to 3,000 men that were in it. Uh, at least around the time of Alexander the Great's uh, reign. Uh, and it was called Companion, the Companion Cavalry, because they all kind of knew each other, uh, and uh, most of them came from the nobility ranks uh, in Macedonia. So I think early on in Philip's reign, if you know about it, uh, Alexander actually led the Companion Cavalry and used it a lot to win a lot of battles against Persia. Uh, I also, Philip had several wives. I think he had like something like seven <laughs> at one point, uh, if you know about this. Uh, and uh, the most famous wife he had uh, was Queen Queen Olympias, uh, who was from the city-state of uh, Epirus, it's called, which is, I think, now where Albania is. Uh, and uh, that was like his most famous wife he had. She's important later because she's the wife, uh, of course, of him, but especially the, the mother of Alexander the Great. Uh, and she'll kind of be very influential, uh, of course, in uh, influencing Alexander. Uh, she's kind of a de facto ruler, by the way, uh, when Alexander's gone. Uh, and after Alexander died, um, 
he was kind of ruthless. I think I'll get to it later, but one of the generals that took over the kingdom uh, after Alexander died had to have her killed. She was that kind of ruthless. Uh, now, one of the things that happened next, I'll get to Alexander the Great later. That's, of course, her, uh, her son with Philip uh, that we have. We'll get to him a little later uh, with that. But Philip, uh, one of the things that happens by about the mid to late 4th century, he starts to consolidate Macedonian power uh, in uh, southern Greece. Uh, and of course, you'll see this uh, slide here. Uh, he basically forces the Greek city-states, I think minus Sparta, to join this alliance together uh, that's called the League of Corinth. Uh, it was nicknamed. Uh, it's also sometimes called the um, Hellenic League or Greek League uh, as well. And that's the main alliance that will be used to in, uh, invade Persia and conquer it. Um, they think the idea of conquering Persia was Philip II's idea, and then Alexander took took it and went with it uh, after his father was assassinated. Uh, and so Alexander was only 20, you know, when that would happen. And so that's really one of the big turning points we'll, we'll get to uh, with Macedonia here. But you can see here uh, on the bottom there, kind of that yellow area, that whole area, he actually came down with his forces and fought several battles against them. Uh, I think the Battle of Corinia, I think, was one of the most famous. Uh, he fought uh, 338 BC, I think it was. And after that, the Greeks capitulated into this alliance with the Macedonians. Uh, and um, yeah, Thebes, Corinth, Athens, a bunch of those city states were kind of in it as well. I think the only one that wasn't was Sparta. Sparta wanted to still align with the Persian Empire, which they were. Uh, they were later neutralized later, uh, but um, what happens, if you know about this, uh, in the year 336 B.C., Philip is assass assassinated at this, I think it was a royal banquet for one of, I want to say his niece was getting married, uh, and uh, this assassin named uh, Pausanias, uh, who they think was an ex-bodyguard, stabbed Philip. Uh, and uh, murdered him. And so um, they think that uh, that, of course, will allow Alexander the Great to seize power afterwards. Uh, they're not sure uh, who was really behind it. They think it was more than one person involved, like in a conspiracy. I think there's two theories. One, that Olympias herself, uh, which was, you know, Philip's wife, may have actually planned it uh, to try to kill him off and put her son on the throne, Alexander, uh, the other theory was that the Persians were behind it. The Persians didn't want, you know, Philip invading, you know, uh, Pers the Persian Empire. And so that's why they killed him. So I think those are the two main theories. But some people think that it's possible that his wife may have killed him, uh, had him killed, actually. So yeah, due to that, of course, because of the fact that, you know, um, his father's now dead, uh, Alexander comes in. He basically seizes power. Try, you know, starts to consolidate his power uh, at that point. And so he'll take power in 336 uh, B.C. and reigns till 323 B.C., about 13 years uh, that he's in power. Uh, and uh, they call him, uh, his real actual name, uh, if you study about it, uh, is actually Alexandros. I think that's the use of the romanticized um, the romanticized version of his name, usually. And then over time, what happened was that, uh, I guess by the time of Roman Roman times, they start calling him uh, Alexander the Great. You know, like a lot of famous you know, rulers are sometimes called, you know, like the Persian rulers, kind of the same thing, great rulers or whatever. Uh, and so, um, so name he's not called till later, you know. Um, let me get into some background about Alexander. So uh, they think what happened after his father died on 3, 336 BC, see this image right here. Uh, he one of the first things I'm going to get to later. He's going to have to consolidate his power. He's got like other heirs, I think, that could have gotten the throne, so he has them eliminated, so he can take power at that point. Uh, he'll have to march on Greece uh, and actually uh, consolidate his power down there because they actually end up rebelling uh, against him. Uh, I think including Thebes. Uh, and so in 3, 335 BC, he had to actually march down into uh, Thebes 
uh, and um, basically forced them to, you know, add hair to the League of Corinth. Um, now, that alliance, of course, that his father had formed, actually Thebes, I think, was the big power in, in Greece at the time in the south. Uh, he actually sacked the city and raised most of it uh, to the ground. Uh, and so uh, that's going to force them back into this alliance uh, with, with Macedonia. And then he's going to use that to eventually invade, of course, Persia later. Uh, some background about Alexander, kind of kind of go through it. But these are some of the sources that write about Alexander and his life. Uh, of course, Diodorus of Sicily, uh, if you know much about that, that's actually the oldest source on Alexander uh, that goes back to around the first century BC. It's kind of weird, but there's not too many sources between the fourth and the first century BC. They, they're actually lost, believe it or not. Uh, and so um, these are the only sources that are still extant uh, around that are based on uh, the life life of Alexander. So yeah, Library of World History, Volume 8, is actually the oldest source on Alexander. Uh, Plutarch and Arian of Nicomedia, those two are actually Greek sources uh, that were famous uh, back in Greco-Roman times. Uh, Plutarch might be one of the most famous, uh, the life of Alexander. Uh, Plutarch was, you know, mostly a Greek biographer and historian. He wrote a series of books that were called The Parallel Lives, and where he compared um, Alexander to, I think, Julius Caesar. And so that one's be a lot of biographical information about Julius Caesar. And then uh, three, Arian of Nicomedia. They think that might be one of the best ones, too, that was written. Uh, the Anabasis of Alexander, uh, written around the same time when Plutarch's was written. And uh, that one goes into a lot of the campaigns of Alexander. And then they do have a Roman one, too. Uh, Kentius Curtius Rufus, who wrote histories of Alexander the Great uh, around the same period, I guess, first, second century, about when that was written. Uh, that's also another source as well. Uh, that's also pretty good. Although I think some people kind of lean more toward the Greek sources uh, than the Roman ones. But it's weird out a lot of the, there's a lot of missing sources uh, on Alexander. Uh, they actually think there were a series of diaries that were written uh, on Alexander's campaigns by a nephew of Aristotle named, I think it's believed his name was Callisthenes or something like that. And um, it was called the Royal Diaries. They think that may have been one of the original sources on Alexander and his campaigns, but a lot of those original sources are, don't exist anymore. Uh, of course, there's a lot of stories about Alexander they always talk about. They have the story of Bucephalus. You may have heard about this uh, when he was very young. He got this uh, horse uh, from through his father, and uh, the horse was actually a gift to Philip II, uh, but it was so wild, it would buck people off, they were going to get rid of it. And Alexander, who was, like, I want to say, 12 or 13 at the time, uh, said he would buy the horse and try to ride it. And, of course, they laughed at him about the horse. Uh, and uh, anyway, he was able to figure out why the horse was so skittish and so wild uh, it was actually afraid of its own shadow. And so he was able to figure out how to ride it. Uh, and then, of course, the horse becomes very, very famous. It's like one of the first, I think, I guess, horses you hear about in classical times. Rides it across the per Persian Empire as he conquered it. Uh, and uh, Bucephalus uh, was a name he, he called it, which meant uh, ox head, because I guess it was kind of stubborn. Uh, there's other stories about Alexander. You may have heard the story about him and um, Aristotle, of course. Um, Aristotle was brought to Macedonia uh, to open up a school to teach Macedonian nobility's children. So I think from the age of maybe 13 to like maybe 15 or 16, uh, Alexander was taught by Aristotle. And so he was a major influence on his life. Uh, I think there's a story where uh, Aristotle gave uh, Alexander an annotated copy of the Iliad, uh, which was, you know, one of his favorite books he liked to read. They think the story of the Iliad, you know, the Trojan War, was a major influence on Alexander on wanting to conquer the world. So one genius to another, you know, uh, both had kind of probably influences on each other overall. Uh, you also hear stories about, uh, there's a, I'll get to him conquering Macedonia and all that, but there's also a story about 
uh, him and uh, he had this friend named Ephesian, you may have heard about, uh, that's also famous. It was this uh, Macedonian general uh, that he had, uh, that I think it was part of his personal bodyguard. And of course, there are rumors in modern times that they were lovers. They're not sure if that's true or not. I know a lot of people speculate that, and it's been speculated in movies, too. Uh, like the, I think the 2004 Alexander the Great movie by Oliver Stone, they kind of, uh, I think, kind of pushed that idea, but they're not sure if that's correct or not. But the Greeks were known for being bisexual, uh, if you know about that. Now, like I said, uh, with that map right there, of course, like uh, Alexander had to come down uh, into southern Greece. Like I said, he consolidated that. Uh, Liga of Corinth together again. Of course, he persuaded them in three by 334 BC to invade the Achaemenid Empire, which uh, at the time was being ruled by this king named King Darius III, uh, who I do have an image of right here. Uh, he reigned uh, over Persia from 338 to 330 BC. Uh, by the way, Darius III was the last major ruler of the Achaemenid Empire. I think he was, I want to say, in his mid-30s, like 34, maybe, when he went up against Alexander. He was, I want to say, just 21 uh, when he invaded uh, Persia. Uh, and so um, I don't know if you know much about the Persian invasion by the Greeks. Uh, they think it was initially done to try and free all the Greeks that were under Persian rule. I think that was the initial thing they were trying to do with it, not really conquer. I don't know if they thought they could conquer the whole thing, but maybe conquer part of like where Western Turkey is, uh, basically. But I guess because the fact that the Persian Empire was weak and Darius III was a weak ruler, uh, they were able to march in there uh, and eventually conquer it, uh, which they which they did. Uh, and um, kind of show you a map here, but I'll kind of show it a lot off and on, but uh, that's the map, the route of Alexander's conquest, of what he would eventually conquer all of, it's mostly the Persian Empire uh, that forms into an empire later, the Empire of Alexander, which never really had an official name. Uh, some people call it the Greek Empire or Macedonian Empire. Uh, and uh, but you can see uh, in the, uh, what is the, they think the spring of 334 BC, he launched his invasion uh, into what is now Turkey today uh, by crossing the Hellespont uh, where the Dardanelles Strait is, northwestern Turkey. And they think he had close to about 40,000 uh, forces, which included Macedonian and also Greek Greek forces that were part of the League of Corinth. Uh, and uh, they have one battle they fought, which was, I guess, the first strategic battle they had was the Battle of Granicus, which was fought near a river called Granicus River, also I think pronounced sometimes Granicus River uh, as well the spring of 334. And it was fought actually not that far down the road from where the ancient Troy was, because uh, uh, there's a famous story where uh, Alexander actually went uh, to ancient Troy uh, and visited the tomb of Achilles. Uh, there really was a tomb there uh, at the time, because that was just like his idol. Uh, and so uh, that was very important, that early part of the campaign, because Alexander was able to seize control of the western part of Turkey start pushing into the interior of, of, of Western Persia at the time. All right, here's kind of a, a slide right here, but uh, yeah, that's the, the initial uh, invasion into um, what is uh, the Western part of Persia where Anatolia or Western Turkey is uh, at that time. Uh, they do think that what ends up happening is it forces uh, Darius to bring in a larger army, which um, from, I, I guess, from central Persia to fight him. And so the two are going to eventually meet up, uh, both their armies. They actually fight twice, if you know about this, Alexander versus Darius. Uh, that battle will be the Battle of Issus, uh, which occurs, they think, around November of 330 BC. It's the first of these two major battles. The other one I'll get to later is the Battle of Gog of Melda, which uh, and um, Darius, uh, they think, had a much larger force than Alexander did. Uh, however, if you uh, kind of look at this map here, and by the way, that, that's that Alexander mosaic uh, that's very famous, uh, which uh, was found at Pompeii. I, think, I want to say going back to the 19th century. 
uh, Alexander the Great Mosaic, where it's also called the Battle of Issus Mosaic as well, which is based on that battle uh, in history. It's actually kind of been restored a lot, but it shows the battle. It shows also Darius on one side on the right, and then you can see Alexander on Bucephalus on the left. Uh, they think that painting was done sometime maybe close to about 100 B.C. Uh, under the Roman Republic. Uh, it's a very famous painting, by the way, uh, in the Roman world. Uh, here's another variation of kind of a colorized one. They've kind of taken these and tried to restore them about what they may have looked like, uh, I guess, complete. Uh, but um, kind of showing the battlefield before what happened. Well, you know, I got Alexander coming up the coast there, uh, kind of going down the southern coast of Turkey where the Gulf of Issus is. And then you've got, uh, you've got also uh, what is Darius forces coming in from uh, the east. Actually, it's weird, but they passed each other up. Uh, in fact, Alexander started pushing down toward where the Syrian gates are uh, in Syria. And yeah, they come back up and fight Darius's forces. And uh, they fight near this river uh, right here that's kind of in between them. There's like mountains hemmed in uh, to, to the east. I think the mountains are called uh, the Amanus Mountains right there, you can see. And that was kind of actually a, an advantage to Alexander because apparently for some reason, Darius couldn't get all his forces in, which was a larger army. Uh, and so Alexander took advantage of that. And uh, using his companion cavalry, which played a role in a lot of these major battles uh, that he won, uh, he was able to break through Darius's left flank, uh, which would eventually cause his army to collapse. In fact, Darius would actually flee the battle, uh, which is something he's kind of known for. If you go back to that short video at the beginning of this lecture, they're kind of laughing about that, him fleeing the battle of uh, Darius. He, he fled that when he fled Gargamela, too, uh, as well. So you can see here the companion cavalry is crashing through uh, Darius's left flank. Uh, and uh, it was such a decisive victory, by the way, that if you know what occurred with uh, Darius, his family actually supported Alexander after the battle. Because they thought, I guess, Darius is such a coward. Uh, and so that's something you actually see. Uh, I think Darius's wife, uh, his mother, I think he had two daughters. Uh, they all supported Alexander uh, afterwards. I think Alexander went on to marry one of Darius's daughters. Believe it or not, I think he would end up marrying two women, uh, Alexander the Great. I think the one that's more famous is Roxana, uh, who he will marry later. But uh, that that actual is that's very important. The, the Battle of Issus is really, I think, the turning point in the whole really uh, war against Persia uh, at that time. And so what what happens here? You go to this map here. Uh, you can see that it allows Alexander then to march southward. Uh, you know, down through Syria uh, at that point. Uh, and he's also, he's going to pretty much take the whole western half of the Persian Empire. He's going to take over Syria, he's going to take over Le where Lebanon and Israel is, and then he's going to march by 332. He's going to march into Egypt and take over that uh, as as well. I think the only thing he had trouble with, if you look at that map, was Tyre, which was a fortified city. Uh, it took him like something like seven months to take it in 332 BC. I actually had to bring up special, I think, siege engines and storm the city, uh, but um, he eventually took it. Uh, and uh, and then, of course, his most triumphant thing, you know, was marching into uh, Egypt at that time. Uh, and uh, the Egyptians, believe it or not, uh, the Egyptians were happy to have Alexander come in because they hated the Persians. They, they had been ruled by the Persians for something like 200 years. Uh, and so uh, they declared at that point uh, that Alexander was Pharaoh, you know, Pharaoh of Egypt. Uh, they declared that he was the son of Amun or son, son of Amun Ra. Uh, and uh, there's actually a famous story. If you go back to that map, I just showed you, uh, I'll show you this right here, but if you go to the, like the, the, kind of left-hand side, there's a story where from Memphis, I think it was, he traveled to what is called a Siwa Oasis uh, using his horse, uh, Bucephalus. He traveled there to go see the oracle of Amun who met with him, and he told him some kind of great prophecy, but they don't know what it is. 
kind of a mystery about that. Uh, he may have told him that he was um, going to conquer the world. I don't, I don't know. But uh, after that, he was declared the son of Ammon uh, and, of course, became the pharaoh of Egypt. Uh, and so um, that was kind of a, you know, kind of a famous point in his life at that point. And um, one of the things he's well known for, of course, when he's, you know, in Egypt is he begins building uh, the city of Alexandria, which you see here, image of Alexandria, the, the modern city today. Uh, it was built and designed by him. It was, uh, believe it or not. Uh, and in fact, he began designing a lot of the streets uh, and where all the buildings would go. Uh, it's kind of like if you know about on the Mediterranean Sea to the west of the Nile, uh, where the delta is. Uh, and uh, it is famous for its lighthouse that was erected afterwards, the so-called Lighthouse of Pharos, uh, which at one point was one of the Greeks' uh, seven wonders of the world. And they, they think he started, I think, commissioning the building of the Library of Alexandria, uh, which held a lot of famous works uh, of the world uh, at, at the time. Uh, Alexandria is going to be very important, by the way. Uh, the building of Alexandria, you know, later becomes the center of the Hellenistic culture uh, in that region of the Near East. So it's kind of a very centralized cultural city uh, that'll be well known. Uh, and um, here's kind of a map of the city of what it looked like. It's interesting how it kind of that, that, that fortress, if you see right there, it kind of looks kind of similar to, you know, where uh, they think like the lighthouse of Pharos was uh, and all that. Uh, you can see some of the important buildings that are there. Uh, the one that's, I guess, the big one that's in that middle part right there is the library and museum of the, uh, you know, the Library of Alexandria that was there at one point. There's like a new one they, I think they built since, I want to say, early 2000s. But um, the original library burned down, if you know about that, during Julius Caesar's time uh, due to a civil war. So anyway, it's kind of talking about uh, Alexandria and, of course, some of the things that he did. They do think his tomb uh, is later buried there uh, somewhere uh, in the ancient city of Alexandria. They think that was later done by one of his generals, I'll get to uh, Ptolemy, but uh, they're not sure where it is. There's a lot of mystery behind the tomb of Alexander. Is it in Egypt? Uh, some people think it's actually in Greece. Uh, also as well, maybe Pella, uh, possibly, but they do back, they do think in ancient times that uh, there were cases where emperors actually went to visit uh, the tomb of Alexander. So they do think it was there. Uh, I think it was a story where Caligula may have been that emperor uh, actually took the armor of Alexander the Great and wore it or something like that. And so they do think it was a real, a real tomb, uh, but they don't know what happened to it. So a big, big mystery about that. I guess if they ever find that, that'll be an amazing feat, you know, in archaeology. Uh, now, one more thing before I get to him finishing off Darius. Uh, there is one thing that did happen in 331 B.C. Uh, Darius tried to negotiate some kind of peace agreement between uh, the Greeks uh, and Persia. So he sent, like, ambassadors to Alexander, uh, but he rejected it. Uh, there's different theories on why uh, he rejected it. I think he thought that the Persian Empire was weak and that he'd be able to just conquer the rest of it. I think also the fact that he wanted revenge against the Persians because, you know, the Persians had invaded Greece a long time ago. So he saw this as an opportunity to, to get back at them. Uh, and so he rejected the peace offering. Uh, there was a case where he met with his generals, by the way, uh, about this idea of peace negotiations to end the war uh, with Persia, one of his generals thought it was a great idea, uh, which was Parmenian. Uh, and Alexander replied something like, if I was Parmenian, I would do it. <laughs> so he decided to reject it. And of course, what ends up happening is he invades uh, into what is Mesopotamia. So that's the next thing I'm going to get into uh, and talk about uh, is the so-called Battle of Gagamela. Uh, that comes in next, uh, which Gagamela uh, is really uh, the pivotal battle at the end that really finishes off the Persian Empire. Uh, it happens, they think, in October of 331 B.C. It's kind of a debate about when it was. I think, I want to say early October, close to maybe October 1st, uh, when it happened. 
It has different names. Uh, they call it Gagamela, which they think was a name that came from a nearby village uh, that was called Gagamela, which I think meant something like the camel's house is what translated as meaning. Uh, also, uh, they think it's um, the name, uh, they have another name, uh, which is uh, either Airbel or Airbella, which is also the name of an Iraqi city uh, that's in the northeastern part of Iraq in what is now Iraqi Kurdistan. They think that's about where the battle took place between him and Darius III, the second battle and most pivotal battle in the end. There's kind of an image you can see, kind of a painting that was done later uh, of the two. Uh, and um, kind of show right here, so October 331 BC, they do think that Alexander's forces was badly outnumbered. Uh, of course, I, I've got numbers there, 50,000 to 250,000. Uh, they think those numbers were kind of disputed. I think there's a theory that Alexander had maybe 40, 50,000 at the most. Uh, and then uh, the, the ancient sources say anywhere from 250,000 to a million uh, that Darius had. But uh, they probably think it was half that, like maybe 120,000, I think is a good average of about, about what it is. And uh, supposedly uh, the battlefield where they fought was actually handpicked by Darius III. He even brought in these special charioteers that used these skilled chariots with skids on the side to cut people down. They turned out to be worthless uh, in the battle. Uh, here's kind of an image of the battlefield and their movements. Uh, the army of Darius was la large, much larger than Alexander. It could have been like only two to three to one, but it was so large that he easily could have been swallowed up uh, by this Persian army. And so Alexander tried to spread out his forces you know, to, to make Darius do the same thing. And so using his phalanx and mostly his companion cavalry, he tried to attack at Darius's left flank, uh, you see. And uh, what happened, it was a trick, if you know about this. Uh, and what happened in the middle of the battle, Alexander switched his forces at a 90 degree angle and attacked really at Darius's kind of left center flank there. And uh, what happened when he uh, attacked at his um, royal bodyguard, he went right after Darius, uh, if you know about that. He panicked again, like he did uh, at the Battle of Issus, and he fled the battlefield a uh, second time. Now, they almost had a problem, though. Like, some of the Persian forces actually broke through. Uh, they attacked him on his left flank, but Alexander had some auxiliary forces in the back to stop him. Uh, and so, after that, he was able to mop up uh, Darius' army. And uh, most of the force that was left over was either captured, which a lot of them were captured, uh, if you read about uh, the casualties from ancient times. I think he said two, three 300,000 captured, which is kind of ridiculous. Uh, but um, after that, Alexander was able then to start taking over pretty much the entire Persian Empire. And he was only like 25 or 26 uh, when he, of course, succeeded defeating uh, Darius III. So very, very young age when he you know, does all this, uh, Alexander the Great. That was like his, his pivotal moment right there uh, in the defeat of Darius III. Uh, from there, uh, he then marched on Babylon, so he took the city of Babylon after that in Iraq. Uh, there's an idea that they, they think that Alexander was going to make that his capital, you know, kind of like the central part of his whole empire. Uh, he got decided to rebuild Babylon, rebuild the hanging gardens of Babylon, which I think was kind of collapsing at the time. Uh, and so um, from there, he then marched eastward. You can go to this map here, but from uh, what is Babylon, he then marched and took Susa. Uh, he then took, of course, all the different cities in Iran. He took Susa, Persepolis, Pasagarde. Uh, he took Ekbatana uh, as well. Uh, so pretty much just mopping up uh, the rest of the empire. Uh, there is something famous, though, that he did. Uh, you may have heard about Alexander. He took the city of Persepolis, which I told you was their main capital since going back to the time of Darius the Great. And in a fit of rage, he burned it down. Now, there's been different theories on why he burned it down. Uh, but um, 
they think it was some kind of retaliation because of the fact that Persia uh, had attacked Greece and they burned Athens, uh, and so he did it in return. Uh, there's a famous story where he had this prostitute, they think, from Greece, and she egged him on to burn it down. I don't know if that's a true story or not, uh, but that's been claimed. Uh, and um, I think when he, I think they say he was drunk when he did it, but I don't know if that was true or not either. Uh, so yeah, he burned it down, uh, which is kind of a tragic thing. So that's why you only see, if you go to Persepolis in southern Iran, that's all you see is ruins uh, from it actually being burned. I think that was the main palace right there that was there originally with this massive staircase in the front uh, that Alexander, of course, uh, had burned down. Uh, of course, he kept marching. Uh, he does find Darius, by the way. You go up there to where the kind of east of the Caspian Sea. He finds Darius the third killed by his own men, uh, which he has him buried afterwards. He actually had the men hunted down, the ones that killed Darius, because he wanted to kill them himself, I guess. <laughs> uh, and so uh, from there, he marches into what is Afghanistan. Uh, he then marches into uh, Pakistan and northern India. And so you can see he's basically conquering the rest of the Persian Empire that's in the eastern part. Uh, all the way to the Indus River Valley, which is the furthest east that he actually reaches uh, at one point. Uh, he does have this one more battle he does fight that you may have heard about. Uh, when he marches into India, in northern India, uh, in what is the Punjab region, he does fight this battle called the Battle of the Hydaspes. Uh, they think it happened in the spring of 326 B.C., uh, and uh, he fought against this king named Porus. You may have heard of him. And that's actually an image of him, I think, in that picture on the right. Alexander is kind of in blue. I think the guy behind him is Ephesian, that, that famous general under him that was his best friend, maybe lover. I'm not sure that's really true or not. Uh, but I think that's him. I think, I guess, Porus was wounded or something, maybe sitting, sitting lying down. Uh, and um, But he would fight him. Uh, in what is the uh, northern part of India. The river uh, is a tributary of the uh, Indus River. So it's also called Jhelum, which is the Indian name uh, they use today. Greeks call it Hydaspes. Uh, and uh, apparently Alexander was camped on the other side, which on the western side of the river. Uh, and then Porus's forces were on the eastern side of the river. And uh, if you know about this, it was actually during the monsoon season, which was starting up around May of 326. And uh, Alexander did an amazing thing. He actually crossed the river uh, on, I guess, what is uh, the right flank of Porus uh, and attacked him on that flank. And it's part of why he won the battle. Kind of an amazing feat right there. So Alexander's like an amazing general you know, for that time period. And uh, if you know about that battle, uh, Porus was famous for using uh, war elephants. Uh, which is something that I think the Persians had elephants too, uh, but they were used more for like pack animals and things like that. Uh, so it's really the first case where they actually fight war elephants. Uh, the Romans later have to fight elephants uh, against the Carthaginians and Hannibal uh, as well, but it's kind of like the peak of the use of elephants uh, in the classical age. Uh, and uh, But he's able to defeat Porus's forces, but it was a bloody battle. I think it was, they think, one of his bloodiest battles that he fought really uh, out of all of them. Uh, and uh, it's really weird about Porus. They think that after the battle uh, had ended, uh, they, well, they thought maybe he'd kill Porus or something like that, but he actually treated him like a king and made him a satrap so of that region to, to, to rule that part of uh, his eastern empire. Uh, and so I think he liked um, Porus because of the fact that he had stood up, tried to st stand up to him and fight uh, instead of like Darius fleeing the battle. So he really thought he was a brave, uh, you know, uh, general, uh, you know, for doing that. Uh, now, if you know what happened, though, Alexander, yeah, he won the battle of, you know, Hydaspes uh, at that point. But after the victory, what occurred, his forces mutinied against him. Uh, in fact, they went to this river called the Hyphasis, uh, which is kind of a little to the east of the Hydaspes River uh, in the Punjab region of northern India, and they sat down and refused to move. This went on for like something like three days, and Alexander sat in his tent, 
uh, and hoping that they would change their mind because he was hoping to conquer the rest of India. Uh, and so he was actually forced to return westward uh, back towards Babylon. I think his men were tired of fighting, uh, which they'd been doing for like, I guess, eight or nine years uh, that they had been fighting. And uh, there's an old saying they used to say later about uh, Alexander is that uh, he wept because he had no more worlds to conquer. Um, so, yeah, if you go to this map here uh, that I got, Alexander then takes his forces down to the bottom, like the mouth of the uh, Indus River, in the far eastern part of that map there, uh, where the um, Arabian Sea is. Half his forces went back uh, by ship. Uh, this guy named, I think, Narcus, I think his name was, a general brought them back uh, through what is uh, the Persian Gulf. And then Alexander, between uh, 326 to 325, uh, probably 324, uh, brought his forces, the rest of it, back through the deserts of Persia. Uh, and it's really crazy, but he actually lost more forces from the men that was with him on the way back uh, to Babylon from all the battles he fought in. That's kind of crazy about that, uh, how, how that happens. Uh, however, he gets back, uh, if you know, like I think within, I want to say, nine months, he's dead. Uh, Alexander the Great. Uh, and uh, they think in June of 323 B.C., uh, Alexander dies, they think, grew ill, I think over a week or two. He got weaker and weaker. They think he went into a coma uh, and eventually died. Uh, at the age of 32, uh, and so that was the end of whatever kind of dream he had of this empire uh, he was forming. Uh, and of course, there's been a lot of images and paintings that have been made of Alexander the Great. Here's kind of kind of an old painting, I guess, uh, showing him uh, on his deathbed. It's probably romanticized, of course. And uh, his men kept asking him, you know, who should they give the throne to? Uh, Alexander had two wives. Uh, his second wife, Roxana, was pregnant, uh, who would later have a son, Alexander IV, but they didn't know, you know what, what that would be uh, at that point. Uh, and so his men kept asking, who should we give the throne to? Uh, and so Alexander said something like, it should go to the strongest. Uh, and so that left a lot of things open, you know, uh, because the fact that uh, Alexander really died without a viable heir at that point. And so what, what's going to happen, what's going to happen, if you know about this, it's going to create a series of civil wars uh, that are called the Wars of the Diodaci, where Alexander's generals are going to start fighting over his empire. Uh, they're going to break it up. Uh, and so what could have been this massive empire that ruled from, you know, Greece to Egypt all the way to the Indus River was no more. It was all broken up uh, during uh, this period. And uh, I'll, I'll kind of talk about it now, but uh, they do think that Alexander's conquest started a new period historically. Uh, if you read about, uh, which is called the Hellenistic Age uh, or Hellenistic Era, I don't know if it really had an official name. I think they also call it Hellenistic Period. It lasts about three centuries, uh, from uh, the fourth to the first century BC. 323 to 30 BC is roughly, I guess, when they date it from Alexander's death and then down to the time of uh, Queen Cleopatra uh, when uh, she, she died. Uh, and I um, think if I had a slide on that or not, I think I've got one right here I can share with you. But they think his conquest brought on this new period. Uh, the term Hellenistic, by the way, is derived from the word Helen, uh, which remembers the word for the Greeks a long time ago. And so the Hellenistic age, in a sense, Hellenized everybody, Hellenized all the world uh, of the Near East. Uh, and so it spread Greek culture, language, you know, science, technology, religion, philosophy, arts, all throughout the Near East, influencing parts of Turkey, uh, Egypt, Iraq, Iran, even India uh, was influenced, of course, uh, by, by Alexander the Great uh, in all that. And so that's something that's kind of famous, you know, about that period of Alexander, you know, really influencing, of course, what happens. Uh, now, um, kind of look at this map right here. That's the, the map of the wars of the Diodaci that we're talking about. So, yeah, they would fight over that vast amount of land uh, that you're looking at 
uh, from you know Macedonia all the way to India and down into Egypt, uh, et cetera. Uh, and um, what happened was over time, these areas were broken up into states, which I guess the name they call it sometimes is Hellenistic states or Hellenistic kingdoms uh, is what they nickname it uh, usually. And uh, I'll kind of go through some of the men that helped found these states uh, over time. Uh, here's kind of a map showing you where they'll be. Those are the Greek names, by the way, uh, of these states and dynasties uh, that kind of form out of it. You got the Ptolemaics, you see down there uh, in yellow in Egypt. Uh, the Seleucus or Seleucids, uh, which of course, Seleucid Empire, uh, that's mostly like in the eastern part of, the, of, of what was Alexander's empire. Iran, Iraq mostly is kind of around where it is, part of Syria later. Antigonid kingdom and dynasty, uh, Turkey and Syria. You've got a few others that are minor ones all over the place. Lysimachian state was also another one that was kind of a minor one. I'll get to Cassandros. Uh, he'll take Macedonia and kind of separate it uh, as a kingdom uh, as well. But yeah, here's one, of course, one of the most famous, uh, which is Ptolemy I, uh, known as Ptolemy I Soter. And uh, he was a Macedonian uh, general under Philip II and Alexander. And uh, if you know about him, he took over Egypt after Alexander died during these uh, you know, so-called wars of the Diodaci, which by the way, the wars of the Diodaci means the wars of the successors, what it means in Greek, Diodaci. And uh, he's famous for taking the body of Alexander, believe it or not, and bringing it to Egypt where they think he had, had him buried. Uh, they think originally he may have buried Alexander in Memphis, and then the body got moved to Alexandria, where they think it is today. But like I said, they don't know where it is. Uh, but the Ptolemaic dynasty uh, is around till like 30 BC. Uh, I think they have something like 15 rulers uh, that reigned at one point. Most of them are named Ptolemy, from Ptolemy the first to Ptolemy the fourteenth. Uh, and then you do have uh, also uh, Queen Cleopatra, who's a direct descendant of theirs, uh, who was one of the last rulers that dies in 30 BC when the Romans take over Egypt. Uh, then you got this other ruler named Seleucus. Uh, of course, Seleucus the first Nicator. He was the king that founded the so-called Seleucids, uh, Seleucid Empire. Uh, Seleucid Empire was really the largest empire uh, out of that formed out of the former, you know, regions of Alexander's empire. Uh, he was another general that went back to the time of, I guess, Philip and Alexander. And um, his empire would last in the first century too, 312 to 63 BC. Uh, it controlled Syria, Iraq, and Iran. And actually ruled from the capital of Antioch, if you know about that, which is in Syria now. But it'll later be conquered by the Romans, uh, just like Egypt is with the Ptolemaic kingdom. So yeah, that one. Uh, then you've got also uh, Cassander. Uh, he was another one, too. Cassander, of course, uh, was this king of Macedonia. Uh, he actually was the um, he was actually the son of um, Antipater. He was a, a general uh, that was under um, Alexander. Uh, and uh, he actually eventually becomes the king of it. I've got to kind of show it right here, but... Um, yeah, they had two two rulers, of course, that were famous. They had Antipater. They were he was a general uh, under Alexander, uh, and then after he died, his son took over. And uh, if you know about Cassander, I was kind of talking about this earlier. He was famous for killing off Alexander's family, like the rest of it, because they think Queen Olympia survived for a bunch of years after Alexander died. So did Roxana, uh, one of the wives of Alexander. And I uh, told you, Roxanne and Alexander had a son, Alexander IV. He had them all murdered. Uh, so he was kind of ruthless, uh, Cassander. But Olympias was also ruthless, too. She had a lot of people killed in Macedonia, I think, before that. And so that's part of why it killed her off, because she was kind of too powerful uh, and all that. But, uh, yeah, that's kind of like some of the, you know, different rulers that kind of took over, uh, you know, they had another one. I was trying to think if I had that one too. I think I do. 
I had one more, I guess I'll mention too, uh, that was famous uh, also, uh, which is this man named uh, Antigonus. They called him different names. I think he's usually called Antigonus uh, the One-Eyed. Uh, he actually uh, formed his own state, Antigonid Dynasty or Antigonid Kingdom, uh, that was in Thrace uh, in Turkey. It didn't last long. I think it collapsed in 301 uh, B.C. Uh, he was an interesting uh, general, uh, going back to Alexander and Philip. He uh, wanted to keep the empire together. And so that's part of what caused the war uh, to break out. Uh, and um, he was eventually killed at the Battle of Ipsus during the main part of the wars of the Diodaci. Uh, and so after his death, the whole empire of Alexander pretty much disintegrated uh, into multiple states. Uh, and so it never, it never really got back together uh, after that. So pretty much broken up and stays that way. Uh, and uh, most of these states, you know, like in that Hellenistic age, you know, we're talking about, most of them get conquered by the Roman Empire is what, what eventually occurs. And I guess the Romans kind of absorb all this Greek culture that's circulating throughout that whole Mediterranean region and become kind of like the Greeks uh, as well. Now, uh, Alexander, you know, like overall about him, you know, they, they consider him to be one of the greatest conquerors uh, in, in not just ancient times, but probably of all time. I think they consider him to be one of the greatest conquerors uh, in history. Uh, he was never defeated in battle. That's one of the most amazing things uh, about Alexander the Great. Un unbeatable, I guess, uh, overall. It's kind of a what if, you know, what if he had lived? You know, what if Alexander lived you know, into like his 50s or like another 20 years? Uh, he might have conquered the rest of Europe, maybe conquered you know, where the Romans would be or conquered North Africa. It's kind of a debate, debate about what would happen, you know, if Alexander uh, would have lived and all that. Uh, but uh, he has been compared with a lot of other generals, you know, Napoleon Bonaparte, uh, Julius Caesar, uh, Scipio Africanus. Uh, he could, of course, name all kinds of generals, um, you know, Hannibal, you know, Carthaginian times, uh, all that. Uh, so, yeah, he is considered, you know, one of the greatest, uh, you know, generals in, in history. And it's kind of a what if, you know, what ha what happened, of course, with, with his empire. So, yeah, it's kind of a short, short historical period. Uh, really study about, of course, that. Uh, now, next week, I'll be moving on to talk about uh, the history of the Romans. So I'll kind of talk about the rise uh, the Roman state, uh, the Republic. Uh, of course, I'll later get to the famous Roman Empire, uh, which is really their most, probably the biggest part of their historical historical civilization. Uh, so I'll kind of I'll kind of get to that later. Daniel Simon, of course, at Baton Rouge Community College. Uh, this week, I'm also going to do a little short review for you. Of course, going for the second exam. Uh, the online second exam, of course, will be on uh, two main topics, which will be ancient Greece uh, and, of course, ancient China. So I think China will be the first part of it, which is shorter. Uh, we have two lectures, you know, on ancient China, and then I did have four lectures on Greece uh, that I had. Uh, the only topics that will not be on the exam uh, will be uh, Alexander the Great, like in the Macedonians, Hellenistic Age. Uh, I'll have something else later on that. Uh, on like a type of quiz assignment uh, for extra credit. Uh, so I will, I will list the PowerPoint lectures uh, with that in online lectures, uh, which uh, some of the face-to-face -face class can also use that uh, as well. And of course, I'm reviewing the study guide questions. Most of these you can find, of course, uh, they're in your study guide uh, in Canvas, but if you go to uh, the back, of each PowerPoint lecture, there should be a list of questions I'll kind of review for you. Let me go ahead and go into some of the questions, of course, that will be uh, on the exam. These are like a, probably a majority uh, that you'll kind of see on the exam. Uh, there may be other questions that'll kind of pop up, of course, from lectures uh, that I have during the semester. Let's go ahead and start with China first, uh, right here. So. Round what major river did ancient China develop its early civilization? I've talked about this before. The Yellow River, also known uh, as the Wang Ho, uh, which is one of the longest rivers in China, 
really Asia and China, uh, which not quite as long as the Yangtze. Uh, but that's considered where China started a long time ago, especially during Paleolithic, Neolithic times. Uh, what geographic features helped to isolate China as a culture? Uh, there's a lot of different things that probably did that. I told you there's a lot of deserts in the West, in Northern China that kind of isolated them. Take Lamakan Desert, uh, also the Gobi Desert, probably the most famous. Uh, to the West and South, you got the Himalayas, uh, Tibetan Plateau, Kunlun Mountains, et cetera. Then to the East, uh, you've got a lot of seas and oceans. Uh, you've got Yellow Sea, Sea of Japan, if you want, uh, also Pacific Ocean uh, as well. Uh, what crops were mainly grown in ancient China? I mentioned that before, but rice and millet, uh, really the two most famous. Rice, probably the oldest uh, of the two. And rice, of course, is the main crop still grown in China today. It's the majority crop they grow the most. Uh, how did the Yellow River get its name? I uh, told you it had something to do with the silt or sediment that's in it called less. Uh, these silt deposits kind of start in the west, western part of China and flow eastward and kind of gives the river kind of a yellowish, brownish uh, color, kind of like the Mississippi River, kind of a muddy type river, uh, which it is. What is the nickname of the Yellow River? Why is it called that? Uh, it's sometimes called China Sorrow uh, because it's you know been prone to, to flooding a lot and they've had a lot of massive floods, which, which has killed a few million people overall. Uh, what are some inventions or technologies that the Chinese were famous for? Gunpowder, probably the most famous thing. Silk, crossbow, paper, like made from like wood, uh, printing, like printing books and scrolls. Uh, compass, of course, you've heard of also as well. Uh, what was the first major dynasty of China? Uh, usually the one they, they talk about that's famous is the Shang Dynasty, uh, which uh, sometimes called also Yin as well. Uh, around what capital near Yellow, the Yellow River did, the, uh, did they develop around? They're talking about the Shang Dynasty. Uh, it has different names, but the modern city is called An Yang, but uh, the ancient name was called Yin, uh, which is Y-I-N. And um, that's sometimes why they call it that name as well, besides Shang. Uh, what were Oracle Bones, a first example of in, in China? Uh, they're first examples of early Chinese writing, where they wrote on bones and turtle shells, et cetera. Uh, what were they used for Oracle Bones? Primarily uh, for divination or telling the future, like prophecy, uh, where maybe a ruler or somebody would you know, write something like, uh, will I have an heir? Uh, will we have a good crop season? And things like that. And so that's how the origin of early Chinese language systems developed uh, before it kind of evolved through other dynasties later. Uh, what second dynasty conquered the Shang? Uh, that was the Chou dynasty, uh, which was one of the longest reigning uh, in China. Uh, both the Shang and Chou had just kings, not emperors. Uh, what technologies, innovations were developed by the Chou for warfare? Uh, they were famous for being one of the for, uh, first to develop iron technology, like weapons and implements for like farming, I guess, uh, and um, like iron swords. I know uh, the crossbow is probably the most famous thing that was invented uh, at that time. Uh, what was the feudal period of China under the Western Chou? Uh, it was a, a period where China was ruled by a feudal hierarchy that uh, went from like the kings and the lords down through vassals. And then they had a system of like different kinds of common people that they had. Uh, and uh, the Chinese uh, called it the uh, Feng Jin, uh, was the Chinese name for it. Uh, what happened after the Chou declined during the Eastern Chou period? Uh, there was a period where uh, China broke up into competing feudal states and it led to the so-called period of the warring states that followed between the fifth and the third centuries BC. And from there you get Imperial China that emerges later. Uh, during what Chinese historical period did the hundred schools of thought begin? 
uh, mostly during the spring and autumn periods when you start seeing all these different philosophies emerging like Confucianism. Uh, what were examples of Chinese philosophies that were kind of created during this period? Uh, Confucianism, which is the most famous, uh, Taoism, uh, as well, uh, legalism kind of, they think, evolved from that period. Uh, I think I told you about the school of yin and yang kind of evolved from that period as well. Uh, who was Confucius? Uh, of course, known as Kung Fu Su, Master Kong. Uh, Confucius was a famous Chinese philosopher uh, that they think lived close to about 500 BC. He was also a politician as well. Uh, he was the founder of, Con of Confucius, which is a type of philosophical system based on his teachings. Uh, what were some examples of some ideas he taught Confucius? Uh, well, Confucius wanted to uh, try and reform Chinese society, uh, make it better. Uh, he also wanted to make government more reformed-wise, uh, based on, uh, you know, civil service testing and things like that. He also wanted to create a better way of life for, for Chinese people. Uh, of course, some ideas that he uh, taught was the so-called five bonds or five Confucian relationships, which he wanted to develop to make Chinese society better. He also um, taught filial piety, uh, which was the idea uh, where people would have respect toward their elders, like father, the, the son having respect for the father, uh, the subject having respect for the ruler, uh, things like that. Uh, ancestor veneration, he taught that too, which spread to other things like Hinduism and Buddhism. They have kind of the same thing. Uh, that's where you honor the dead. Uh, they sometimes call it ancestor worship, basically, where you honor, honor the, the deceased ancestors and things like that. Uh, what is the golden rule? Uh, the golden rule was Confucius's uh, most famous teaching, uh, do not impose on others what you do not, do not wish for yourself. Uh, so it's considered his most famous thing. Uh, treat others how you want to be treated, I guess, would be another way to maybe translate it that way uh, if you want. Uh, what is Taoism? Uh, who founded it? Uh, Taoism was a type of Chinese philosophical system founded by Lao Tzu. Lao Tzu. And uh, it was a type of Chinese philosophical system where they sought um, people to live in nature in harmony with the universe. Uh, the so-called Tao or Tao, uh, which means the way. And it, it incorporated, if you remember correctly, the yin and yang uh, ideas, the whole dualistic universe where there's two opposites of each other. Uh, who wrote the famous work, Art of the War, which they think was written around the same time? That was Sun Tzu. Remember Sun Tzu was this Chinese general uh, and um, military tactician that they think influenced a lot of military ideas uh, in Asia and later in the West too, as well. Uh, what was the period of the warring states that occurred before the advent of the Imperial China? Uh, that was where basically at the end of the Cho period, which was declining, uh, China broke up into competing warring states where they fought for two, two and a half centuries between the fifth, fourth and down to the third century BC. And as you know, one state emerged to conquer them all, uh, which was the Qin Kingdom or Qin Kingdom, and they formed the first imperial empire at that point. Uh, yeah, what kingdom and dynasty emerged to conquer all of China, 3rd century BC, kind of a repeat, but yeah, the Qin or the Qin uh, Kingdom, of course, did that. And they would, you know, like I said, create imperial China. I also said, remember, that's where the name China came from, uh, it was from that particular dynasty. Uh, who is the first emperor of China? That was Qin Shi Huang, uh, who was part of that Qin kingdom that, you know, remember unified uh, China at that time at the end of the Warring States period. Uh, what was he famous for? Uh, he was famous for the fortification he built, which he was the first to do, which was the Great Wall of China. He began constructing it uh, originally. Uh, and of course, if you remember correctly, it was built mostly with uh, using like rammed earth, like like mud or earth, uh, and not brick. Because the brick brick Great Wall we think of, uh, like you see in that image on the left, was not built 
until the Ming Dynasty, like around the 6th century. Uh, why did he build it? Uh, it was built to block barbarians that were invading China. So, you know, laid back like the, the Mongols and the Huns. And uh, the main foreign invaders they were trying to block initially were the Shang Nu. Now, they think we're kind of ancestors of the Mongols and the Huns. Uh, what is the nickname of the Great Wall of China? How is it built? Okay, I've already talked about that already, but uh, they, the Chinese usually call it the 10,000 Li Long Wall, which uh, sometimes translates as meaning 5,000 kilometer wall. Uh, it has other names too, like Wall of Death, because uh, they think that thousands of workers may have died building it and were buried in the wall. They've never really proven that before. Uh, wall of Genghis Khan, I think, has been another term they use because the Ming built it to prevent the Mongols uh, from invading China uh, and all that. Uh, but by the time of the Manchu, you know, about that, the Manchu broke through uh, like around the 17th century, and it was obsolete after that. Uh, what capital did Chen Shi Wang build his massive tomb, his mausoleum? Uh, that was, of course, the city of Xi'an. So now it's called Zion Yang uh, as well. Uh, and then the later name they call it too is Chang An, uh, which is the name under the Tang Dynasty. What guarded, what was its nickname? Uh, that was the so-called Terracotta Army, which was a statue army of thousands of, I guess, of his, what was supposed to be his army uh, in the afterlife were supposed to protect his tomb. Uh, what dynasty conquered the Qin dynasty? That was the Han dynasty. They came in next. Uh, and the Han was, we know about this, considered one of the most famous dynasties of imperial China. One of the longest, at around 400 years uh, overall. Uh, who was the founder? The founder was a, uh, a commoner who took power after they overthrew uh, the Qin, whose name was Lu Pang, or some pronounce it Lu Bang. Uh, and he later went by the name Han Geosu, or Han Keosu, uh, either one. And it meant something like the exalted emperor of, of Han, I think was the translation or one of the translations uh, of what his name meant. Uh, who is the greatest ruler of the Han dynasty? An emperor named uh, Emperor Wu of Han or Emperor Wu Di, it's called sometimes as well, who reigned between the second and first centuries B.C., it's one of the longest reigning. I think it was like 54 years or something like that. And he was very militaristic. That's kind of why it's called sometimes martial emperor. You might see sometimes uh, because he was known for uh, ex great expansionism in China because uh, uh, the Chinese began expanding eastward uh, towards Korea, southward towards Vietnam, and then westward, of course, as well into the Gobi Desert uh, as they pushed back the Xiongnu. Uh, what did Emperor Wu extend west in the Gobi Desert? Uh, the Great Wall of China, uh, which he did at the expense of the Xiongnu. He was one of the first emperors that was successful in defeating them in battle. Uh, what trade route ran west from China starting under the Han? That was the Silk Road or Silk Route, uh, which that's why they extended the Great Wall. Uh, and uh, the Silk Road, of course, ran towards Asia, like India, Persia, and then, of course, toward the Roman Empire uh, as well. Uh, what types of innovations and inventions were the Han known for in China? A uh, bunch of them I talked about before. Paper and printing, that's probably their biggest thing they're kind of known for legacy-wise. Like woodblock printing, I think, was one of the type of printing that they invented, uh, the Han. Wheelbarrow, uh, I think the iron plow by then, I think the compass, and I think I kind of mentioned like uh, acupuncture, I think was something, I don't know if that's a big deal, that kind of invented about that time uh, as well. I think seismograph too, I think was something that they may have invented around that time too. Uh, what are the two periods of the Han that are divided between the Zen dynasty, which was ruled by that brief emperor named Wang Mang? Um, they had the Western Han, uh, sometimes called Former Han, and then they had another one called the Eastern Han, uh, called the later hand, and it was called that because of the fact that they moved the capitals. The original capital was uh, at Xi'an, where Chang'an will be, and then under the eastern hand, it moved to Luoyang, which was sometimes used as the capital in China. 
Uh, what is the nickname of ancient China around the period of the Han? They sometimes call it the Golden Age of China, which goes from like the Han up to the Tang Dynasty. Uh, what was the Tang Dynasty famous for in China? When did it exist? Uh, the Tang Dynasty was the peak period, really, of the Golden Age of China. Uh, that's when a lot of um, art and literature uh, in China peaked. I think Buddhism pretty much uh, had spread all throughout China uh, by that time. Uh, it was around from about 618 to 907 AD. So it kind of goes between the ancient and what we call medieval times uh, around that period. Uh, who were some fang famous uh, Tang emperors that were well known? They had Gao Su, yeah, Gao Su of Tang, and he also had Tai Song. I think those two were considered like the founders of the Tang dynasty uh, around the early 7th century. Uh, they also had the only female emperor of China as well, which was Empress Wu Zaitian, Zaitian uh, or, or also called Wu Chao, I think it was called that way uh, as well. We talked about her. And then they also had Zong Zong, I think was one more I talked about that was famous. It was one of their last great emperors uh, who reigned, I think, in the next century, uh, like in the 8th century. And he was the one they think that that kind of built up Chang'an as its capital and named it uh, the City of Perpetual Peace. Uh, what was the Grand Canal of China? By the Tang Dynasty, uh, the Chinese had kind of almost finished the intercoastal canal system uh, on their, you know, the east coast of China. And the system of canals to connect the Yellow and the Yangtze rivers, but it also connected up to where Beijing will be, like when, when it's, the capitals moved there. And uh, the canal system is about 1,100 miles in, in length. Uh, to give you an idea, and it's, of course, important for their whole economy and trade. Uh, what are some later dynasties of China that ruled between the Middle and Modern Ages? Uh, that I think the most ones you probably need to know, uh, the Yuan Dynasty, we'll get more into them. Uh, that's when the Mongols, you know, seized control of China, Genghis Khan and Kuba Khan, uh, etc., uh, the Ming Dynasty, you probably mentioned the most. The Ming Dynasty was the main dynasty that took over China, ran the Mongols out, and they built the main brick Great Wall that we know today, uh, the one that everybody likes to go visit. Uh, and then they were replaced later by the Qing or Great Qing Dynasty uh, in around the 17th century, who, who ruled to like 1912. Uh, and that was the last Chinese dynasty they had before you know, the emperors uh, step down. And after that, China was like a republic, uh, pretty much. Uh, so that's basically the, the Chinese questions that I've got uh, listed there. Uh, I'll go over also the ones on the Greeks uh, as well, which is more extensive. I think there's like 15 questions uh, on, I want to say on China, and I've got, forget how many I've got on Greece. Right now it's 25, 30 range, but I'm not sure if I'm going to add or any more or not, but let me go through those real quick uh, overall. So yeah, we first have the uh, that period of the Aegean civilization or Greek Bronze Age uh, that I kind of went over lecture-wise. Uh, around what sea did most of the ancient Greece develop as one of the first European civilizations? That was the Aegean Sea. It's kind of like upper part of the Mediterranean uh, between Turkey uh, and Italy. Uh, what mythological figure is Europe named after? Uh, Europa, who they uh, believe was in mythology, a uh, Phoenician princess that was kidnapped by Zeus and brought to Crete. And after that, they have the beginning of the first you know, European civilization there, uh, the Minoans. Uh, what is the historical name for early Greek history when the Minoans and Mycenaeans flourished? Uh, that would, of course, be the Aegean uh, civilization. Uh, but they also call it the Greek Bronze Age uh, as well, because uh, most of these civilizations were in the Bronze Age and living throughout the Aegean Basin overall. Uh, who were the Minoans? Uh, Minoans were these pre-Greek uh, maritime civilization that lived throughout the Aegean, and it was considered one of the first European civilizations that, that emerges uh, at that time. Uh, they, of course, lived predominantly on the main island of Crete is where they were, but they were kind of throughout the Aegean, uh, like uh, like in the Cyclades 
they traded between like Greece uh, and Egypt and other parts of the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, who was the archaeologist that discovered the Minoans? What palace did he ex excavate in the early 1900s? Uh, that's Sir Arthur Evans, a British archaeologist that came to Crete, and he was one that discovered it. And uh, he found this palace that was there called Canossus, which was also like a kind of like a capital and city of the Minoans. And he began to excavate and rebuild it uh, in the early 1900s. Uh, who is the mythological king associated with the Minoans? The, the name that, you know, King, that um, Arthur Evans names them after, that would be King Minos, uh, who they're not sure was real or not, uh, but it's mentioned by, of course, the, the ancient Greeks. What famous legend is associated with uh, King Minos? Uh, that would, of course, be the famous Minotaur. Of course, that monster that was part bull, part man, uh, that was killed by Theseus. Uh, what was the main uh, Minoan language discovered by Arthur Evans? Uh, that would be Linear A, which was like a type of pre-Greek writing system that uh, was mostly written on like clay tablets, uh, and it's mostly undecipherable. I think about 80, 90 symbols were used with it. They think it's the first European language. Uh, that kind of influences others later, like Linear B, and uh, probably was influenced with Greek as well. What types of artwork were the Minoans famous for in their palaces and their homes? Fresco paintings, like these lime plaster paintings that were put on their walls. And I think I told you the most famous one that survived from that time was the so-called bull leaping or bull jumping uh, fresco uh, found at Canossus. Uh, what caused the Minoans to decline? Uh, it was actually caused by cataclysmic events that happened uh, in the Aegean. Uh, one of the main things that happened initially was the so-called Thera or Santorini volcanic eruption happened. Uh, which destroyed Akrotiri, which was one of their port cities uh, in the Cyclades. They think it also destroyed Crete uh, via tsunamis and I think earthquakes later. And that enabled the Mycenaeans to come in and take them over. Uh, what myth or legend is possibly associated with their decline? Uh, some believe that the Atlantis story told by Plato, uh, the Greek philosopher, is kind of similar to that and might be. Uh, where the, where the story of Atlantis comes from. Uh, who are the Mycenaeans? Uh, where did they develop in Greece? Uh, the Mycenaeans uh, were a pre-Greek, late Bronze Age civilization that developed in the mainland uh, of Greece, like in the Peloponnese and other parts of southern Greece uh, as well. Uh, they were a warlike people, uh, as you see, like, Iliad and the Trojan War, and they did have a language, which um, Sir Arthur Evans found, too, uh, on Crete, which is called Linear B, uh, which was a more complicated language that they think um, evolved from Linear A, uh, but has been, they think, translated uh, mostly. I think Linear B uh, was an influence on later uh, the Greek language that would develop, you know, in the future. Uh, what types of cities were they famous for building? Uh, which one was the most famous? Uh, the Mycenaeans mostly constructed fortified cities. Uh, they were built on high points or hilltops, like an Acropolis. And uh, they were, no, no, they were no, known for having uh, kind of a palace complex, uh, kind of like you saw on Crete as well. And... Um, they're later called Mycenaean because Mycenae, which is in the Peloponnese, like in the northern part of, part of the Peloponnese, was the most powerful of the different cities. And so that's why they give it that name. Uh, Homer also calls them Achaean, but they're not sure what their name originally was. Uh, who was the German archaeologist who did a lot of discoveries in Greece, like with the Mycenaeans? Uh, that would be Heinrich Schliemann. Uh, who they say later found or excavated what they think is Troy uh, in, in Western Turkey. Uh, what was the Lion Gate? Uh, the Lion Gate was one of the main entrances to Mycenae. It's famous for its lions that are on top of the actual entrance when you come into it. And um, the Lion Gate in, I guess, the 
fortifications of Mycenae are very famous for their Cyclopean type masonry uh, that I've talked about. Uh, what tombs were discovered there at Schliemann? Schliemann mostly found the grave circles, like grave circles A and grave circle B, uh, which were these uh, cemeteries of Mycenae and nobility. Uh, but they also excavated at that site uh, the so-called Tholos tombs, uh, which were these beehive-shaped tombs that the Mycenaeans constructed, like the treasury of, of Atreus, which I guess is the most famous one that's well known. Uh, what epic poems were the Greek poet Homer famous for writing about? Uh, that would be like the Iliad, uh, the Odyssey, uh, which they think may have been written close to about maybe 9th century BC, uh, maybe 400 years before uh, Herodotus lived. What was the Trojan War? Uh, what was its main cause, according to Homer? Of course, the Iliad is primarily, of course, about the Trojan War. Uh, the Trojan War was this mythological war according to the Greeks, uh, that was fought between the Greeks, uh, which they think may have been the Mycenaeans or Achaeans, as they were called by Homer, and then they fought against the Trojans, uh, who were based in Turkey, like this northwestern part of Turkey. According to Homer, the reason why the wars broke out was because of some quarrel among the Greek goddesses over which one was the prettiest or fairest, and so uh, the gods uh, asked uh, Paris to decide, you know, which goddess was the most fairest, uh, called, so-called judgment of Paris. And he was given the apple of discord. And so he chose Aphrodite. And so Aphrodite made Helen of Troy fall in love with him. And so he basically took her to Troy and started the war. Uh, so all because of a woman, basically. Uh, how long did the, the Trojan War last? Around 20 years. Uh, they believe. Actually, I'm sorry about that. That's not correct. Uh, ten years. Ten years, how long it lasts. Uh, but um, Homer um, says that, if you read Homer or whatever, he only writes about it for like a short time period. So yeah, ten years is actually what it is. Excuse me. Uh, who are some major characters in the Iliad? Um, I told you Agamemnon was one of the famous ones. He was the actual, you know, king of Mycenae that led the Greek forces uh, to attack Troy. Uh, also, he had a brother named Menelaus. Uh, Menelaus was the one that went to Agamemnon to really start the war. Because remember, they had taken his wife, Helen. Uh, he was the king of Sparta. And then uh, I told you about Achilles uh, was the greatest hero, of course. Uh, of the Greeks, the best warrior. He was supposed to be one that was uh, kind of part god and uh, was only vulnerable as Achilles. Well, he's called Achilles heel, of course. Uh, also, don't forget Odysseus uh, as well. Odysseus, um, king of Ithaca, who's also later uh, in the story of uh, the Odyssey epic. Uh, he's the one that, you know, that came up with the whole Trojan horse idea, uh, which later they say led to uh, why the Greeks beat the Trojans. Uh, on the other side, I guess major characters on Troy's side, you had King Priam, uh, was the king that led the Trojan forces. You had two major sons I told you about. Of course, Paris the Younger, uh, the one that started the war when he took Helen. And don't forget Hector. Hector, of course, uh, the older son, uh, was the one that was the best hero or warrior of theirs. He was later killed by Achilles, of course, uh, in the story of the Trojan War, the Iliad. Uh, what Turkish site did Schliemann possibly discover ancient Troy? Uh, it's a site now called in Turkish Isarlik, uh, which means place of fortresses or fortifications. It's located close to the stri Strait of Dardanelles, uh, where the Aegean is. And um, this site was used to build multiple fortifications and cities that went back maybe to Hittite times. Uh, and so Schliemann went there in the 1870s and excavated it. And so some people think that might be uh, the site of Troy, but it's kind of controversial still. Uh, what artifacts were found by Schliemann in 1873 at this site? Uh, Priam's treasure, they pulled out of a wall there uh, at Hisarlik. It was mostly gold artifacts. I told you they ended up in Germany, and now they're, in, of course, in Russia now. Uh, what 
and of course, we moved on after that. I kind of got into and talked about the rise of the Greek city-states uh, next. Uh, what people invaded Greece during the Greek Dark Age that began around 1200 B.C., or really the 12th century B.C. would be it is. Um, the so-called Dorian invasion comes in, where you get these different Greek peoples that emerge. Uh, and the proper name in Greek, they're called as the Hellens, if you remember that correct. Uh, Hellens. And Hellens were like Greek-speaking peoples uh, of the Iron Age that settled there uh, in Greece. Now, totally, they were descended from this ancestor of theirs who they think may have been a king in mythology whose name was Helen, but with two L's, H-E-L-L-E-N. Uh, there are different tribes that they were related back to this king, Helen. Uh, it says three, but I think there are actually four uh, that actually break up into eventually. The two main ones were the Dorians, which were the most famous that came down. But the Spartans, you know, are related back to all that. Uh, Ionians, uh, as well, like Ionians are kind of where the, you know, Thinians come in later. Uh, Aeolians, and then you had another tribe they called the Achaeans, not as well known, uh, but that one was another one they had as well. Uh, what is the Greek name for the city-state that emerged around the 8th century when the Olympics began? Uh, that would be the uh, so-called polis, uh, which is what they call it, city-state uh, in Greece. Or if you want the plural version, uh, poli, which I told you there's like, must be like 1,200 or more of them uh, that settled throughout the Aegean Basin. Uh, Athens was the most famous one and, the, and most populated, and then Sparta was the largest one. Uh, those two were big rivals of course, during that period. Uh, what two main historical periods make up the Hellenic Age, which is like the so-called main Greek age, of course, of the city-states uh, between 776 to 323 BC? Uh, they had what they call Archaic or Old Greece, uh, where it goes back to around the Olympics. They think that's when the city-states emerge. And it goes down to maybe close to 500, so really 8th to about the 6th centuries. And the classical Greece, which was the peak period of the city-states, was about 500 to 323 B.C. That's where you got all these famous people living, like Herodotus, Pericles, uh, and so on. What were the Acropolis and the Agora in a Greek city-state? The Acropolis was uh, kind of like this high point of the city where cities were built on top of, and uh, it was like a public space area, which was used for like a fortification. Uh, you can see it was used for temples like the Parthenon to be built, uh, et cetera. Uh, so it was a big public space there, uh, which had a lot of different buildings that were constructed. Uh, they also had the Agora, or Agora, pronounced either way, I guess, um, which was like an assembly area where the citizens would gather uh, for different things publicly. And so it was like a public square. They could sell goods, markets, uh, baths, uh, probably forms of entertainment and things like that uh, as well. It's kind of comparable to the Roman Forum when we get to the Romans later. What types of government did the Greeks develop? They had many different types. Uh, traditionally, uh, they originally had monarchies a long time ago, but they got rid of those. Uh, they did have tyrannies, like ty tyrannies or tyrants. Uh, where they have these aristocrats that run the state like dictators. <coughs> Those aren't as popular, uh, but the two most popular forms of government were oligarchy and then a democracy. Oligarchy was a type of government where basically an upper class like nobility or aristocrats ran the state. Uh, I think I told you oligarchy meant ruled by a few, and then democracy was where all the male citizens would participate with running the state and the government. And democracy meant ruled by the people. And oligarchy was more popular with Athens. Excuse me, got that backwards. Oligarchy was more popular with Sparta. And in Athens, of course, uh, had Athenian uh, democracy. Oops. Anyway, um, now I'll get also into military stuff uh, as well. Uh, hoplites, um, I've talked about them. Hoplites, remember correctly, were these heavily armed infantry foot soldiers of the Greek militias or armies that they had. Uh, and they used these pretty much throughout the whole Hellenic Age and even Hellenistic Age down to the time of Alexander the Great. Uh, what battle formation did they use? Uh, most hoplites fought in what they call a phalanx, 
uh, type battle formation, uh, and uh, they fought mostly with using hoplite spears, which is called a dory. Uh, what were types of weapons and armor used by hoplites? So besides the um, hoplite spear or dory, uh, they had the short sword, which was usually called a zithos, which they had different types. Of course, hoplon was one of the main things they used in the phalanx formation, which was those round wooden shields that they used to protect themselves in battle. Uh, they had different kinds of armor. Uh, they had cuirass armor, which was like torso body armor, which wrapped around you, mostly bronze. Uh, Linothorax was like a linen type um, type of uh, of uh, armor you wore. And they did some kinds of like a layered armor, like a lamellar, uh, like a scale armor uh, they had as well. Uh, also, they had like greaves, which greaves were like um, leg armor that they had. And um, also uh, talked about how they also uh, had helmets, like the Corinthian style helmet was the most famous one they had. Uh, also, I did have one more weapon I'll mention too that might be important later. Uh, the the like the Macedonians did have like pikes they used, uh, which were long spears used by infantry to repel like other infantry and cavalry, and that was usually used in larger sized phalanx formations where they have these long spears that are eighteen feet long. Usually, the Greeks called it a sarissa. Uh, what peninsulas did Sparta and Athens develop in Greece? Uh, Sparta developed on the Peloponnese Peninsula, which is like the southern part of Greece. And then uh, above that, kind of to the east or northeast of Sparta, you had Attica, which is where Athens developed, the so-called Attica Peninsula. What was the name of the ancient region where Sparta developed uh, in northern, uh, excuse me, in southern Greece? That would be called um, Lacedaemon, what they called it, uh, which I told you was named after an ancient mytho mythological king of Sparta. And uh, Laconia is the modern name they call that area now. And I told you Sparta evolved from the wife of uh, Lacedaemon, uh, the queen of, the queen, or her, his queen was called Sparta, of course, the name. Uh, who were the helots that the Spartans used to, to farm their land? Helots were like these Greek slaves that they were, forced to like, you know, grow everything uh, because I told you that the Spartans really didn't work. Uh, they mostly just fought war uh, in general. It has been debated about whether they're like slaves or serfs, uh, but uh, may, may have well been slaves because uh, the way they treated uh, the Helots, uh, who heavily, heavily outnumbered you know, the Spartans. Uh, who was King Lycurgus? Uh, Lycurgus was one of the founding fathers of Sparta. Uh, he was a Spartan king they think that may have lived uh, between the 9th or 8th centuries BC. Uh, he's known for developing a lot of their laws, uh, their constitution, uh, and also maybe their court systems and assemblies that they had. What was the Agog? The Agog was the Spartan military school uh, where they trained Spartan boys to be soldiers uh, in their armies. Uh, they usually trained Spartans from about the age of 7 to 20 uh, before they would live in barracks together until like 30, which is a long time. And I told you that the Spartans were usually in the army till like 60 years old. Uh, how was the political government of Sparta divided up within its oligarchy? I told you they had two kings, which were hereditary, and the kings mostly dealt with, like, military and helped run the state. Uh, they also had this thing called the Gerousia. The Gerousia was this um, Spartan consul that had 30 men on it, 28 elders and the two kings. They dealt with, like, Spartan issues, law, court, court systems, kind of like, almost like a Supreme Court, in a sense. Uh, the Apella was the uh, Spartan assembly. Uh, where Spartan men, I think 30 and older, could participate. And then the Ephors also helped run the state. The Ephors, which had five, were these magistrates that uh, took turns also advising and running the state as well. 
Uh, what was Athens famous for as a city-state? Who was it named for? Of course, named for Athena, right? We know of uh, Athens is this type of Greek city-state famous for its culture, arts, uh, you know, humanities, architecture, like with the Acropolis and the Parthenon. But also, don't forget, it's naval power as well. They were known for having a naval maritime power uh, throughout the Aegean uh, and the Mediterranean Sea uh, as well. Of course, name for the goddess Athena, of course, I'll talk about later uh, as well. Uh, who was Solon of Athens? Solon the Wise, he's called sometimes. Uh, he was a famous Athenian uh, politician, statesman that was known for a lot of reforms to Athens. Uh, he's considered, by the way, a founding father of Athenian democracy. Uh, he was known for a lot of reforms. Uh, he reformed the economy. It was one big thing he did uh, where he got the state to uh, invest a lot more into exports, like olive oil, et cetera. He also developed their social class system, which I told you had four classes in it. Uh, they think he also developed a lot of their assemblies, uh, like the Council of 400, uh, which was a bulle or a council where citizens were elected every year uh, to run, run the state. Uh, Ecclesia uh, was this also uh, another assembly they had, uh, which all uh, male citizens could participate on later. Uh, he's also known for developing the Areopagus, which was a type of Athenian court system uh, that met uh, near the Acropolis. Uh, what type of ruler was Pisistratus? He was a, a tyrant, one of these Greek tyrants that ran Athens, and uh, if you remember correctly, the tyrants were these aristocrats that took over a state, usually with backing from the lower classes, and they usually ran the state like a dictatorship, is what they did. <clears throat> and if you remember correctly, Pisistratus had two sons that also ruled Hipparchus uh, and also Hippias that reigned down to about 510 B.C. before they were ousted. Uh, who was Cleisthenes? Cleisthenes was an Athenian statesman. Uh, he was known for employing a lot of democratic reforms. Uh, he's also considered to be a founding father of Athenian democracy. What reforms was he known for at Athens? Uh, he developed the Council of 500, which replaced the one that Solon had before, Council of 400. And he was also known for developing what they call ostracism uh, to oust people they thought were a threat to the state. All right, then we moved on to talk about, of course, the Greco-Persian Wars as well. Uh, and uh, what were the Greco-Persian Wars or Persian Wars? Uh, these were a series of wars fought against the Achaemenid Empire in the early 5th century BC, also called Persian Empire, or First Persian Empire. What was the cause of the wars breaking out? Uh, they were caused by Persian expansion uh, into the Mediterranean world, especially into Western Turkey. And it was also caused later by this revolt there, too, which was called the Ionian Revolt, which I'll get to later. What was the Achaemenid Persian Empire? Uh, it was an Iranian empire which ruled parts of the Near East uh, between the 6th and 4th centuries B.C., over 200 years. And um, it was a huge empire uh, which went from, like, India in the east uh, all the way to uh, Egypt and Turkey, uh, and it was centralized in Iran a long time ago. Uh, what was the background and origins of the Persians? Uh, they were related back to Indo-Aryan Indo peoples that came out of like close to where the Caucasus region is, uh, where I think Georgia, Russia is today, Ukraine. And uh, the people that settled in Iran later are known as Indo-Iranians you know, like the Medes and the uh, Bactrians and the Scythians and the Persians, uh, they're all kind of related to each other. How large was this Persian empire? It was maybe around 2 million square miles or larger, uh, the largest empire, uh, in, in, you know, in size at that point in history. And it was on three continents at one point, too. Uh, who was Cyrus the Great? Uh, Cyrus was the founder of the Achaemenid Empire. He also founded the dynasty uh, as well. Uh, he ruled in the 6th century uh, BC, uh, and he conquered a majority of the empire uh, from 
uh, Iran, part of probably Afghanistan, Turkey, Iraq, and Syria. The other parts were conquered later, they think. Uh, or the Persian kings, Darius the Great and Xerxes the Great, famous for his rulers. Uh, Darius the Great expanded the empire further toward the Indus River. Uh, he also took the empire and he divided it up into 20 provinces, which were ruled by what they call a satrap, which were these viceroys of the Persian kings. He also built the royal road. He also founded Persepolis, which became their main capital uh, later. He also standardized their coin system as well. And I'll get to it later. Uh, both both uh, Darius and Xerxes the Great tried to invade Greece, uh, but they failed. Uh, what was the Royal Road? Uh, the Royal Road was a Persian highway system that linked uh, Iran with Iraq, and then it ran in the west, uh, all the way to Western Turkey. So it linked all those areas, main parts of the Persian Empire. And <clears throat> it was begun by, they believe, Darius the Great. And uh, the total length of the actual uh, highway system is, is almost 1,700 miles. I already talked about how did the Persians divide up their empire. They, they divided up into basically provinces, like 20 of them, and they were ruled by a satrap, which was like a royal governor handpicked by the Persian kings. I think usually the province was called a satrapy, which was named after the actual viceroy. What was Zoroastrianism? Uh, it was, of course, a Persian religion that was uh, the main religion of multiple Persian states uh, throughout, throughout that region. And... Persian Empire, that was really, that Zoroastrianism was really one of the first widespread <clears throat> religions throughout the world at the time. It was founded by Zoroaster, they think was an Iranian prophet uh, and teacher, and they based the religion off of the god Ahura Mazda, which was a Persian god of creation and also wisdom. And um, the name supposedly meant wise lord uh, in Persian. Uh, also, let's get to it as well. Who is the main historian who wrote the Greco-Persian Wars? That was Herodotus, of course, uh, who uh, father of history. He is, is the oldest source, of course, on the Greco-Persian Wars. It's either called the Histories of Herodotus or History of the Persian Wars uh, as well. What revolt in Western Turkey helped spark the first invasion of Greece? by the Persians, that was the Ionian Revolt, where city-states like Miletus in Western Turkey revolted, and Athens supported it, and that's what pulled them into the war, of course, later. Uh, which Persian king sent the first Persian invasion of Greece in 490 BC? That was Darius the Great, or Darius the I. Uh, that invasion would fail, uh, but uh, what was the Battle of Marathon? The Battle of Marathon was one of the first major battles of the Persian Wars, especially in that first invasion. And uh, Marathon was a failed attempt by King Darius the Great to uh, attack Attica and, and, I guess, seize control of Athens. And um, the Persian forces were badly routed uh, on the plain of Marathon. Uh, who was Pheidippides? Pheidippides was this Greek herald or messenger that was sent to Athens after the Greeks won the Battle of Marathon, and uh, it's a famous story told by Herodotus and also the Roman writer uh, Lucian. Uh, though it's kind of mythological, but that's where they get the marathon run idea, because uh, he ran supposedly 26 miles uh, to Athens to tell them they'd won. Uh, he led the second invasion of Greece in 40 BC. That was, of course, uh, Xerxes the Great. Uh, what strategy did the Greeks develop against the Persians when they formed a military alliance? Uh, because of the fact that Xerxes was invading through northern Greece with a huge army, uh, the Greeks decided to uh, band together and send forces northward to block uh, the invasion. Uh, so I told you they, block, they tried to block them at two points, Mopoli Pass and the Strait of uh, what they call Artemisium, <clears throat> using the navy. Uh, what occurred at the Battle of Thermopylae? Th Thermopylae was this three-day battle where a small Greek army of 7,000 hoplites tried to hold off a huge army of the Persians. It occurred in August 480 BC, 
And uh, the Greek force were led by the Spartan king Leonidas. He's very famous, <clears throat> who is killed in the battle, but they're able to slow the, the Persian forces down at that point. Uh, that led to a pivotal battle. What naval battle changed the course of the war and eventually led to the Greeks winning? That would be the Battle of Salamis uh, that followed uh, where the Greek Navy, with both the Athens, uh, with most of their ships, uh, sinking a good chunk of Xerxes' navy. Uh, what was the Delian League that was set up by Athens and other states after the Persians were kicked out of Greece, mainland Greece anyway? Um, the Delian League was a military alliance that was set up uh, by Athens and involved a bunch of other city-states. And the idea to continue the war against Persia, that led to the War of the Delian League, they sometimes nicknamed it, where the Greeks tried to push uh, the Persians out of the Aegean, which they were successful with. They took back Thrace. Uh, they took back a lot of the Aegean islands. They eventually would take control again of Western Turkey. Uh, and so it was kind of a turning point uh, in, in the whole Greco-Persian Wars. What was the Athenian Empire that rose to prominence in the Golden Age of Athens? Uh, the Athenian, it was a Athenian-based empire that was found out of the Delian League. And over time, it, it took control of the Aegean. Uh, it was also a trading empire where, you know, Athens and Attica traded throughout the Aegean. And, of course, it made Sparta jealous later. And so it caused, you know, the so-called Peloponnesian War. Uh, what was the Age of Pericles? It's sometimes a nickname for what they call the Golden Age of Athens, uh, when, when Athens was dominant as a power in their empire. And it peaked under the rule of Pericles. Uh, Pericles was this Athenian statesman and general uh, that was famous for a lot of reforms to, to Athens. They think Pericles was the most famous of the Greek politicians that they had. And um, what was he famous for? Uh, well, he's famous for a lot of things. Uh, one thing, of course, we saw was that he was a big patron of the arts. They took a lot of money. They spent it lavishly uh, to... Uh, you know, build up the state. Uh, they rebuilt the Acropolis. They built all those public buildings on the Acropolis, uh, like um, the Parthenon. Uh, he, you know, spent money uh, like helping out Phidias build stuff. Uh, what else? Art. They put it in art, playwrights, you know, sculptors, things like that. Uh, he expanded democracy, and he also spent a lot of money trying to expand their, their naval power as well. Uh, what war caused the downfall of the Athenian Empire that emerged during the age of Pericles? That was the Peloponnesian War, which is almost like a civil war that broke out in the Aegean Basin. And it pitted the Delian League, backed by Athens, versus the Peloponnesian League, backed by Sparta. So you got all these states like Thebes, you know, uh, that doesn't like them, uh, and a few other states, um, Corinth and a few others that are there. Uh, and so um, Sparta ends up winning that war, and it breaks the back of their Athenian empire. Athens is not as powerful later. What famous historian wrote, uh, wrote the uh, Peloponnesian War? That was Thucydides. I mean, some people think is the father of what we call scientific history, if you want. Uh, then we got that last lecture on the Greeks, which is Greek culture. Uh, what were the ancient Olympics? When did they supposedly begin? Uh, the ancient Olympics were one of the oldest, most famous uh, Panhellenic games uh, that went back to 776 BC. Uh, of course, they're famous for being held uh, at the city state of Olympia uh, in the far, I guess, in the northwestern part of uh, the Peloponnese uh, Peninsula. They were held every four summers. And uh, remember, the, the games were put on to honor the god Zeus. That was the whole point of it. It's more for religion than sports and all that. Uh, but what were some sports or athletic events associated with the Olympics? Uh, one of the most famous was the, it was the pentathlon, uh, which they invented, uh, which included running, discus throw, long jump, wrestling, javelin. It's where a lot of those sports originate from. Chariot racing was also big, or horse racing, uh, as well told you. Pancration was like a, like a blood sport cross between boxing and wrestling. Uh, boxing, of course, too, 
Well, as well. Now, I think I told you about hoplitodromus was another one that was kind of popular, uh, which is a so-called hoplite race. Uh, women had their own games. I don't know if that's a big deal, but they had games called the Harian Games, which honored Hera. So, the, like I said, the games were segregated between men and women. Uh, why were the Greek Olympics banned? Uh, they were banned because Christianity was becoming the religion throughout the Roman Empire. And so it was a plan to stamp out paganism, uh, you know, and promote Christianity. I have told you the, the emperor that did that was Theodosius the Great around the year 393 CE or AD, if you want. When were the modern Olympics Games established? 1896, well, the first Olympic Games met at Athens, Greece. It would be like the first summer games uh, and all that. And so that's when the first Olympic Games came in modern times. And then winter games were added a little later in the 20th century. Uh, who are some examples of Greek playwrights and their plays? Uh, told you there were only three main playwrights that wrote drama plays, uh, Aeschylus, Sophocles, and Euripides. They wrote tragedies. Uh, Aeschylus was known for for the plays like Arestia, which was like a trilogy of plays based on the house of Atreus and what happens to Agamemnon and his family. Uh, they got Sophocles, who they consider to be the greatest of the dramatists, uh, who wrote plays like Oedipus, the Re Oedipus Rex or Oedipus the King, uh, which they think that's the most famous one uh, ever done. Uh, Euripides had plays uh, like Medea, uh, that's well known. Now, Tolly Euripides had the most plays that survived uh, from ancient times. They had one more playwright, don't forget, uh, of course, Aristophanes, but he didn't write really tragedies. He wrote comedies. He wrote comedy satires. Uh, he had plays like Lysistrata, The Clouds, etc. Uh, and they consider, remember, Aristophanes to be really um, the father of comedy, kind of starts it. Uh, who was considered the first great philosopher of Greece? Uh, I told you that was Socrates, uh, who uh, lived around the 5th century BC. Uh, he's really the first to have like a philosophical school uh, in Greece. And he was known for his so-called dialectic method of teaching, uh, which is sometimes called the Socratic method, which is a type of um, educational teaching method, or if you want to call it pedagogy, where you would use a question and answering format uh, to bring out, I guess, argumentative ideas. Uh, what was Socrates' best known pupil or student? Uh, that would be Plato. Uh, Plato, of course, considered to be one of the greatest Greek philosophers, probably the most influential uh, into Western philosophy, called sometimes, you know, Platonic philosophy or Platonism, you know, named after him. What school did he found in Athens? Uh, Plato is famous for founding the Academy uh, which the academy uh, was considered the first major school of higher learning where they taught every every subject. Uh, and so it'd be kind of comparable to like almost like a university uh, today. So they taught anything from math, science, the arts, history, probably military science, whatever, I guess, whatever they had there. Uh, and um, Plato, um, had various works he wrote. I guess the two I've told you the most that were famous, probably the most famous ones, Apology of Socrates, where, you know, he has a lot of dialogues where he, you know, talks about some of the things that Socrates said to his students. Uh, and uh, the Republic is really his most famous work uh, that survived from ancient times, which uh, the Republic is kind of like a political treatise. Uh, who was Plato's greatest student and a philosopher as well? Uh, that would be Aristotle, uh, who was this uh, Greek philosopher that came out of northern Greece, like around Macedonia. And uh, Aristotle was known for a bunch of things. He had a couple schools that he had that he founded, one in Macedonia, one in Athens uh, that he had. Uh, the one in uh, Athens was a rival school to the academy. Uh, it was either called the Lyceum or peripatetic school. And uh, it was a school that taught everything too, like the academy, but it was kind of known for concentrating on some of the scientific fields uh, like um, natural sciences and so on. Uh, and uh, I told you Aristotle was the one that kind of popularized ideas like the four elements, uh, the ideas of the solar system, 
uh, I think are kind of pushed at that time, like the geocentric model, which was wrong. Uh, and then uh, Aristotle also was famous when he was in Macedonia. He taught Alexander the Great. Uh, he had a big influence on him and I guess why he conquered later. Uh, who were the Olympians or 12 Olympians that took over the earth according to Greek mythology? Uh, these were uh, the chief gods uh, of, of like laid back to Zeus and his family uh, that lived on Mount Olympus, according to the Greeks a long time ago. And uh, the Greeks called them uh, Dodecathian, which meant the 12 gods. Uh, so they're kind of considered the most important ones. They had other gods, hundreds and hundreds of them that they had, but those ones are considered the most important ones and the ones that a lot of the Romans later kind of adopt uh, as well. Yeah, the Olympians supposedly lived in mythology on Mount Olympus, which is located in northern um, Greece today, around 9,500 feet tall, which I think the Romans kind of don't believe that later, uh, but some people thought Zeus and his family lived there. Uh, who was their main leader along with his two powerful brothers that divided up the earth? Uh, of course, Zeus was the chief god, kind of like the father of the, of the gods, and uh, he and his uh, brothers and sisters had overthrown Kronos, uh, one of those Titan gods, in that so-called War of the Titans or Titan Maki, and they took over the earth. Uh, and then what happened was, if you remember correctly, Poseidon got the oceans and Hades, of course, got uh, the underworld. Uh, who are the 12 main Olympians and what are, the, what, what are they attributed to as gods of the Greek and Romans? Attributes, I guess, of one of that. Uh, I'll kind of go through uh, the different gods. So Zeus, like I said, is called Jupiter by the Romans. Uh, Zeus, of course, is the most powerful chief god they have, uh, often called the thunder maker, you know, known for his thunderbolt. Uh, and Zeus is the one associated with, of course, Mount Olympus. So he's the one that kind of rules uh, over the world. Uh, and he's also kind of considered like, I think, uh, god of thunder and lightning sky, but also Lord Justice. Uh, Poseidon or Neptune rules the seas, of course, oceans, cause earthquakes, tsunamis, uh, things like that. And Hades or Pluto, uh, their other brother, of course, rules over the underworld. Uh, Poseidon's got a trident. Remember Hades, Pluto, of course, uh, he's got that uh, helm of darkness that he wears that covers his head and makes him invisible. Uh, other gods, you've got Hestia or Vesta, I told you was like these are sisters of Zeus, Poseidon, Hades. Uh, Hestia, of course, was the goddess of the hearth when they kept that eternal flame of city states or in Rome. Hera or Juno, of course, uh, the sister and wife of Zeus. Uh, she's kind of like this mother goddess associated with motherhood, a uh, protector of, I guess, women with childbirth and things like that. And Hera is a very powerful goddess. Uh, they even have games that honor her, like the Hurrian games, of course, at Olympia. Demeter was another sister, of course, too, Ceres. Uh, she's, of course, the goddess of the harvest dealing with grain crops. Uh, then we got some other gods, of course, also here, Athena or Minerva. Of course, these are the children of Zeus uh, as well. And, uh, of course, remember her, Athena is the patron goddess of Athens, of course, the name comes from. She's associated with things like wisdom, like knowledge, uh, the arts, uh, but also a goddess associated with war and peace. Uh, she often looks like a hoplite, of course, in images. Apollo, of course, Romans call him that too. Apollo, of course, son of Zeus, uh, was a god associated with mostly sun, but sun and light, but also associated with things like music, poetry, prophecy and truth as well. Artemis or Diana, of course, often associated with hunting, a uh, goddess of the hunt, one of those virgin goddesses, uh, and a daughter of Zeus. I think I tell you Apollo and Artemis were kind of like, I think those ones were kind of like twins or something like that. Uh, Hermes or Mercury, uh, so-called messenger god, uh, he's often associated with things like money, luck and fortune, uh, merchants, uh, tend to worship him uh, along with people like uh, also uh, ath athletes and um, thieves uh, as well. Because you know about Hermes, he's known for being fast, has wings on his helmet and wings on his feet. Aphrodite or Venus, of course, the goddess of love, beauty, fertility, uh, considered one of the greatest goddesses of, of 
the fairest of all, and of course may have helped to cause you know the Trojan War. Uh, of course, we've talked about before. Uh, her lover is Ares or Mars, uh, who's the god of war uh, as well. Uh, then Hephaestus or Vulcan, another god. Uh, he's of course associated, with, you know, god of fire, uh, metallurgy, and making of weapons and things like that. And Hephaestus or Vulcan was often known as the blacksmith of the gods. He made like weapons for the gods and things like that. Who was Dionysus or Bacchus? Uh, remember I talked about him, a uh, very important god uh, in Greek, Greco, Roman culture, a uh, god associated with wine and winemaking, because, you know, wine is with everything, you know, in the Greek, Roman world. Uh, of course, a lot of temples, they use, you know, wine uh, and rituals. Also, there's with fertility. Uh, Dionysus was often associated with a lot of festivals like the Dionysia or Bacchanalia, of course, uh, at Athens or later Rome uh, and all that. Uh, who was Eros or Cupid? Uh, Eros or Cupid, of course, was, uh, of course, the, the son of Aphrodite uh, in Ares or Venus and Mars. And he was the god of erotic love. Later got connected with you know, Valentine's Day, I think, in the future. But um, that's, that's, of course, another god that's kind of not as famous as some of the other gods, but it's kind of well known uh, overall. That's it for today. Uh, don't forget, like, if you got a question, you know, about the class, you can always email me. Uh, don't forget, you know, you got also Canvas discussions. If you want to ask me a question about the class uh, or any of the lectures, do let me know about that. You can also leave comments and questions uh, with the lectures uh, on my YouTube channel uh, as well. So that's it for this review, of course, uh, for the second exam. So, you know, good luck, of course, on it. Uh, if you have a question about it, you know, whatever, do do let me know.